appreciate each one of you being here tonight. And uh, you excuse me, I'm trying to get my composure. I just came out of the Olympian program teaching their lesson. So I, I had all this garb on being one of the wise men, telling a story from the perspective of the wise man, uh, one of the wise men. And uh, uh, how many of you know where the um, wise men came from? They came from the east, but where? Around Persia, Babylon, that area. And uh, came from the east. And, of course, uh, I told the boys and girls, maybe some of you, how many of you believe that they came to that little manger scene? Raise your hand. No, they didn't come to that manger scene. They came to a house two years later. All right? And you can find that in the book of Matthew. All right? Chapter 2. All right? You look it up. It's right there. And uh, a lot of people, the misconcept we have today of the fact of uh, uh, Jesus was two years, of old, two years of age when they came to the house. And uh, if you look that up in, in, in the Bible, you find that to be true. And we kind of lop it all together with the shepherds. And they were there at that manger scene that night when he was, uh, was, was born. But uh, uh, they didn't. And of course, we, we take the concept of three wise men. According to history, there were many more wise men than that. Uh, of course, we take it from the concept of the, uh, the gold and the franks, frankincense and the myrrh. That's where we get the concept of three wise men. But there could have been many more. Uh, do I know how many there were? No. <laughs> we don't. But uh, the concept is this. Many times we don't read Scripture, and so we're not knowledgeable of what the Bible has to say. And we begin to teach all these philosophies and theories. And just instead, listen, just take the Bible for what it says. Amen? Amen. Just read the Bible and you'll know the truth. Well, tonight, before we get into our study, uh, we have a missionary and his wife. Well, both of them are missionaries and they're even a little girl. All right. And uh, 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 Ivan and Susan, pronounce the last name again for me. Chacon. Chacon. Yes. All right. I want Brother Chacon to come on up here. All right. Uh, though I didn't know he was going to be here, I, I still think whenever we have a missionary comes in, I, I like to introduce him and, and give him a few minutes of opportunity. And uh, who knows, in the, in the future, we may have, be able to have him back. But uh, Brother Chacon, I want you to give us a, a few minutes. Take about five minutes and give us a brief about what's going on in your life and, you know, your call. And then, uh, as the Lord leads, we possibly can have you back. All right. Okay. So go ahead and speak to our good friend. Thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, my name is Ivan Chacon. I'm from Peru. My wife, Susan, she's from Ohio. She's from Ashland. And our daughter, Chloe, is from Chile. Peru, Ohio, and Chile. Uh, I, uh, I got saved in January 1998 in Hunter Baptist Church in Peru. Um, uh, and in in 2000, uh, we are now uh, working with Macedonia World Baptist Missions, and our home church is Calvary Baptist Church in Ashland, here in, in Ohio. Um, I have been in Chile for nine years, opening churches. Uh, I was working in Chile, in Chile until 2005. I was in Chile as a single missionary for seven years. Opening churches. The first church uh, was planted in 2005, and I worked there until December 2008. Many were saved, and God bless us with a with a building. And I train a group of men of what we have now four pastors work serving God full time. We started a um, Bible Institute, and in the last person was a disciple. He opened that church in the last December. Uh, in 2009, in 2008, 
uh, June 2008, Susan, uh, she was visiting Chile for her first time, and we met in, in Chile in 2008, and she returned in 2009, uh, and she was in deputation for a single missionary in, in the States, and she returned for all the time in 2012. I was waiting for her, praying for her, and I was in love of okay. her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in, in 2009, I started a second church in Santiago, in the capital of, of Chile. And, and God, God bless us with a building that the same church pay the, the, the bills every, every month. And they pay the last bill in September this, this year. Six, uh, sixty thousand dollars for for our house, and and this this people is very poor in this sector of the capital. But they learn to support missionaries, and they are supporting now twelve missionaries. I think what in Santiago or in Chile, this church is a unique church supporting twelve missionaries. Maybe one or or two churches more, because uh, the the people in South America think. No, the, the missionary have money. The missionary, if he visit me, he 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 um, need uh, left something for the church. And when we teach the the Bible, they understand and they are uh, helping, supporting missionaries. And get, God bless the church. Um, in in two years ago, we we got married. In, in Chile, and we started another church, Trinity Baptist Church. Three churches we started. Um, God bless uh, with people. Many uh, believe in Jesus. Uh, we disciple, disciple them. The, we were uh, working with uh, with uh, couples in in the church. And, and we we, are, we have been in the states uh, for nine months traveling uh, in deportation because we, we went uh, to ice our support support uh, our goals uh, returning to Chile is uh, to start another church in the capital in downtown Santiago why downtown in downtown we have almost seven million of people. 7 million. If we are thinking in one big city in Ohio, Columbus is a city with 800,000 people. 800,000 people. Santiago is almost 7 million of people with maybe 100 churches, but the half, they are Calvinist. They are fighting with, 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 with uh, not other pastors uh, um, and the uh, other missionaries. They are they are thinking in no preach the gospel. Uh, we need missionaries in Chile. If you if if God send you, we will be happy with you working together in Chile. Um, I ask your prayers uh, because we we want to to raise our support in the next year in December. Thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, we are thinking uh, to start one Bible Institute in Chile for trying and send missionaries. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. I appreciate it so much. much. All right, God bless you. Let's give him a real hand, all right? And uh, he might have some cards he might want to pass out. I have one up here that I'll be praying for him. But uh, going to the country of Chile. And so uh, be praying for him if you would. He and his good wife and her child. That the Lord would bless them. All right, if you take your Bible tonight and turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 119. We'll get into our study. And uh, I thought this would be a good, uh, matter of fact, it just worked out that uh, it would be a good uh, text to talk about Christmas a little bit. Uh, what are you going to ask God for Christmas? Now, think about that, because most of us never ask God for anything for Christmas. We're, we ask, you know, people ask us what we like to have, like our husband or our wife or, you know, maybe your, your teenage kids, they might ask you, uh, what would you like for Christmas? Well, get me a white shirt. That's what I usually say. Get me a white shirt or get me a tie. Usually I don't let them pick out my ties. 
I'm very particular on my ties. But um, I'll let them pick me up, pick out a white shirt, and get me some socks, get me something else, and I'll not mention what that is. And so, uh, but anyway, uh, really, what have you asked God for this Christmas? And usually people don't ask God for anything for Christmas. Did you ever think about that? Here, the psalmist, I think, asked God for several things for Christmas. All right? Uh, we have a great God. And He wants us to give Him our requests. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about us, uh, you know, talking to Him and asking Him for things. Matter of fact, why don't you turn back, you're in the book of Psalm 119. Turn over to the book of 1 John. This is one of my favorite verses because uh, it uh, not only gives the chapter where we have assurance of salvation, but it also gives us the assurance of uh, God's going to answer prayer. Uh, God wants us to know He's a God that gives. Uh, do you think God would be a bad example before you and I if He said, Give and it shall be what? Given to you again. Press down, shaking together, running over, that He'll put into your bosom, so to speak. So if God says, Hey, give and shall be given, do you think He's going to be a bad example? No. God gives us really more than what we deserve. Amen? Amen? He gives and gives and gives and gives. And I want you to look here, 1 John chapter 5, and look down at uh, verse number 14, if you would. And let's read it together out loud. And this is the confidence. Come on, everyone read. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. God hears us. And He knows exactly what we need. Now, someone said, he may say no, but he always answers prayer, all right? Because you might ask, uh, you might ask for something like my son did when he was a little kid. When Mona and I lived in uh, New Jersey, there on Madison Avenue, uh, we were there. And one day, my son asked me for a butcher knife. Now, do I love my son? Yes. But I'm not going to give him that. I'm going to say no. I'll give you something else. Maybe a good spanking, you know, but, uh, but I'll give you something. But uh, that's the same way it is with God. Sometimes we ask for things that are more detrimental to our lives than, you know, what they would be good. So at that point, he, 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 he may not answer at that particular time, but he may say no because it's not the right thing, but he's given you an answer. He's answered you. So God wants us to ask. Um, I think that, uh, and I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to do it. I, I made a statement a while ago, and I, some of you kind of had a question mark over top of your head. So I'm going to have you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 2 real quick. And when you get to Matthew chapter 2, I want you to hold your place there. Stick a finger in. You've got plenty of fingers. Stick your finger in chapter 2. Then I want you to take, and I want you to go over to Luke chapter 2. And you'll get your finger back in just a few seconds, so uh, stick with me. All right, now, if you would, look down at verse number 12 of Luke chapter 2, and I want you to read out loud with me that verse. Here we go. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Uh, it said babe there, didn't it? All right. Now, go over to Matthew chapter 2. Turn back to Matthew chapter 2, and you get your finger back. All right. And look at verse number 11. All right. The wise men have come, and they followed the star... 
Matter of fact, this star was a very unusual, unique star, a uh, different phenomenon that they had not observed before. Being wise men, they were, uh, we, we call them astrologers today. They studied ideas, they studied books, they studied the stars. And so the star was an unusual star. Well, here in verse 11, uh, when they came to where the star was, and when they were come, verse 11, unto the what? house they saw the what young child. young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshiped him and when they had opened their treasures they presented unto him gifts gold frankincense and myrrh and I'm not going to go into detail of those three things that they gave him because each one of those three things indicated something very important in regards to the life of Jesus Gold, I'll just simply say, always represented, back in that particular time, gold always went to kings. The regular people did not have gold. Gold was a possession of kings. All right? And then uh, you can study the other two things out, which refer to his death. All right, look back to the book of Psalms now. I want to share that with you very quickly, because some of you kind of sat, stood there, I mean, sat there, and you, uh, there was a question mark over your mind when I said that Jesus, they, they didn't come to, uh, to see Jesus until he was uh, two years old, and he was at a house, all right? He wasn't in a stable. He was at a house because two years it took them to get uh, from their location over there near Babylon or Persia into the actual area of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And Jerusalem is not very far from Bethlehem, by the way. All right, look at Psalm chapter 119. We, what are you asking God for this Christmas? Well, the psalmist here has some very important things that he wants us to understand what we're to ask for in regards to our lives. And we've been studying these sections, and for you that are with us for the first time, in Psalm 119, there are 22 sections and in each one of those sections are eight verses. And in each of those verses, you have an indication of nine different words that refer to the Bible or the Word of God. And you're going to see that spread out through this particular uh, study of Psalm 119. And of course, the 22 uh, sections all start with one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. All right? So, and they all are to help us to understand what the Word of God has for our life. How important it is the Word of God that you read it every single day of your life. It's like food, Job said. It's, uh, he said it's, uh, it's, uh, he, re uh, he rejoiced in the fact it was more than his necessary food. So, as a psalmist, whether, and I've said this before, whether it was David or some other writer of the psalm, they wanted to know the Word of God in such a strong way that they would never go astray. Because remember this, David had gone astray, didn't he? David committed some awful sins. Thy word, quote it with me, Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, the more you know the Word of God, it's going to be like a stronghold to your life to keep you from falling into sin, making the wrong decisions, going in the wrong direction. I don't know about you. I don't want to go down the wrong path. Amen? I want to go down the right way. See, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting, the book of Matthew tells us. So, all of us need to have that. Now, look at Psalm chapter 119. And I want to jump back to the previous section for one verse only because it deals with the same thought as the very first verse of verse 33 of this section. I want you to look back at verse 25 uh, that we studied last week. All right? Look at it. My soul cleaveth under the dust. And then he makes a request. Read the second part of the verse 25 with me. Everyone together. Quicken thou me according to thy word. You see, God wants us to be quickened in our lives. Uh, look at verse 33 and down. You, uh, there's some very important ver words there in regards to referring to the Bible. But if you go on down to verse number 37, let's read it together. Here we go. 
turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Now stop right there for a second. What does the word vanity mean? What's the word vanity mean? Words of thanks. What else? Empty. Empty. Void. God wants us to understand something. We were empty until He quickened us. Now, hold your place in Psalm 119. And let's go to a New Testament scripture real quickly, if you would. Over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul talks about this quickening that takes place in your life and my life. Especially when we come to know the Lord as our Savior. And then after, God also quickens us in our understanding, in our lives, because many times we become uh, up empty in our lives because we're going in the wrong direction. We're not uh, following God's Word. But here's what He does for us the day we get saved. Alright, look, uh, look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. Read, a matter of fact, read the first verse and then I'll read down through verse 5 and you can follow along and then we'll read verse 5 together. Read it together, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You see, quicken there means to make alive. To make alive. To come alive in our life. Now, look at verse 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love were with he loved us. Read verse 5 with me. Here we go. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. Now that's the quickening power. That's the quickening element. Grace is that quickening element in our lives. Now, watch this. That element is not just for the day that you get saved, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But every day in our life, grace is a quickening thing for you and me. The day we die, grace is a quickening thing because it takes us from this life into the next life. He gives us that grace. He gives us living grace. He gives us dying grace. See? And it's all done because of God's quickening power. Now, look back at Psalm chapter 119. So the first thing is, ask God to quicken, make alert, make alive according to His Word. Uh, that's a very good thing to do when you're studying the Bible. You and I many times kind of have a gloss over our eyes that we can't see what He's trying to say to us. So what do we, what do we need? We need to be quickened. Alright? Now, let's go a little bit further. What person of the Trinity does He use to quicken us? The Holy Spirit. Turn back to the book of John chapter 14. It all goes to the principle that you and I need to ask God to do that. God doesn't force anything off. He doesn't force salvation on you. He doesn't force other things on you. But He wants you to understand. He wants you to have a quickening to be able to understand the Word of God. Now look at John chapter 14 and look over at verse number 26. All right, let's read it together. But the Comforter, and that's the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall do what? Teach you. Now stop right there. Some things are all things. Why? Because he knows all. 
He's omniscient. The Holy Spirit is as omniscient as God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit, the day that you get saved, comes to live within your life. So He is that quickening power the Bible talks about. So He teaches us all things. Now let's look at the rest of the verse. And bring what? All things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. Now, what does that mean? That means you don't have to be hesitant to talk to people about salvation or the things of the Lord because you may say, well, I, I can't remember all those scriptures. The Holy Spirit, Spirit can bring them back to you. I've been in the pulpit many times and I never even thought about a particular verse and all of a sudden, bam! The Holy Spirit brings a scripture to my mind. It goes right along with, I, I hadn't even planned to give that scripture. But the Holy Spirit brings it. He brings it to your remembrance. By the way, when you and I are about to get in trouble, the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance to keep you and be a deterrent from you getting into that sin or making that wrong decision if you will listen to Him. See? Amen. A lot of times we want to go ahead and do it anyway. See, I, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do this because I want to do it. Yeah, you know, that, that's called the flesh. All right. Didn't Paul said, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right. All right. Look back at Psalm 119 and look down to verse number th uh, 33 again. I just wanted to bring verse 25 and, uh, of the previous section out. And I want to bring verse 37. And we'll, we'll talk more about it in just a few minutes. All right. The first thing he wants us to understand is he wants us to understand that we're to ask him to teach us. Now, I know I've told this to you before, but I'm going to tell you again. Back when I was a teacher at uh, Central Baptist Schools, and since uh, it's academy now, but Cincinnati, uh, uh, when Mona and I were in Cincinnati, we lived there and we taught at the school. I taught in the high school. She taught in the elementary. I taught uh, a lot of Bible classes, and one of the classes I taught was an archaeology class. And I was, it was actually a college class. And I taught them archaeology, and the kids, some of them, they just weren't getting it. I mean, it was a tough class. And one day I said, let me ask you to do something. Why don't you ask the Holy Spirit to teach you? And so from that time on, I started the class. I always started with prayer. But I started the class... And I said, you ask the Holy Spirit to teach you, and I'll, I'll ask the Holy Spirit to teach you also. You know, many of those kids who were making very bad grades, they started making really good grades, Ed, because the Holy Spirit taught them and made those things known to them. You see, He knows everything about the Bible. He knows everything about the secular as well. And we were studying biblical archaeology, so he can let them know that. And I mean, that class just came alive. I mean, they began to discuss things more and uh, they began to learn more. And when they took the test, they, they knew the material. The Holy Spirit will teach you. Now, let me back up just a little bit. I believe the Holy Spirit teaches us a number of different things. And I've told you this before. When I was working on a car, I didn't know how to do a particular thing. And I stopped and I says, God, you can teach me what to do here to get this thing done. After I'd fooled around with that thing, Brother Jeff, for hours, and it was a water pump, and I've shared that with you before, on a Buick, and it was like my eyes were open and I saw exactly how to fix, put that thing in there. I mean, it was just like, bam, all of a sudden. God can do that for a Christian because after all, He's over everything in the first place. Amen? He can do that. 
He can give... The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, in James 1.5, let him ask of God. Wisdom is looking at things from God's perspective. And God looks at all things. He knows all things. So we can task Him. And the psalmist here says, in verse 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy what? Amen. Statues. Now, the word statues is one of the words that refers to the Bible. It's another, another aspect. Now, I'm not going to go into go back to our notes when we first studied this, but each of those nine words means a particular thing. And the word statues is a particular principle that God shows, shows us in our life. And we need to ask Him to teach us. And then He says, and I shall keep it unto the end. In other words, we won't forget it. And the biggest thing that we need, the reason we need to not forget God's Word is because it will keep us from sin. And that's going back to Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So, every day when you start to read the Bible, you ought to take and say, God, teach me what I need to learn from this Scripture. Now you say, why should you do that, preacher? Here's why. God has you reading a particular scripture for a reason in a given day that can help you in that day in the decisions you make in your life. God knows exactly what you need for that day. He knows the nourishment you need for your life. He may be preparing you through that scripture for tomorrow or maybe a week from then, to prepare you to deal with a situation you would never be able to deal with. God does that endlessly. Matter of fact, I was out visiting last evening. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't know what I was going to get into. But I asked the Holy Spirit before I got out of the car, I said, now, I don't know exactly how I'm going to answer these folks and the situations I'm going to deal with. Please teach me what to say. Give me the exact things to say when I begin to talk with them. And you know he did. And he'll do the same thing with you. Many times, and I'll go back and use another illustration. When I was in teaching uh, there at Central Baptist Academy, um, many times we had to call up parents because we've had a problem with a kid. Hey, anybody here have a problem with a kid before? Yeah, sure. Uh, all kinds of situations. Well, before I called a parent up, I'd always say this, Lord. Help me to say everything I ought to say and leave unsaid those things I shouldn't say. Because you can get a real heated discussion with a parent. Though the kid is wrong, in his, their eyes, he's right. Or she. And I always say this to the Lord. Lord, lift up a standard against any weapon that's formed against me. And help me to be kind and help me to be Christ-like. Give me the exact words. Teach me exact words I should say. And I can say this. In all the years that I taught, not one time did I have a problem with a parent after I talked with them. Not one time. And I believe it's because the Holy Spirit taught me what to say. And He can help you too. He can help us. He can teach us. So, He wants to teach us. Not just anything, but everything. God can give you that if you ask Him. And the most important thing, and I believe you would agree with me, is the Bible. Amen? The Bible is the most important book that God gives us because in the Bible, it gives us the way of life. And we need to know that. There's a second thing here we see found in verse number 34 that we ought to ask God for. Look at verse 34. Give me what? Understanding. Understanding. Every one of us need to have understanding every single day of our life. Amen. Because sometimes things happen to us and we don't understand why they happen. But God can give us understanding why they are. Or why they may be upon our life. 
and ask God for understanding, especially of His law. You see, we look at things sometimes we say, now why would God want me to do that? Well, God will give you understanding of why He's asking you to do a particular thing. God doesn't want us to be in the dark about things. God wants to turn on the light. And He wants to give you understanding. And He says, give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Now, if you don't understand the law of the land, you won't be able to keep it. Okay. I mean, if you, if you don't understand uh, what the speed is going down the road, you won't be able to keep the right speed. Okay? I mean, that's why they put those little signs up there that say 35 or 55 or 45, and you better obey it. Because if you don't, a bubblegum machine is going to come after you. It's a law. The law keeps us in checkmate. See? This Bible here, the more you understand the less likely you are going to go astray from God. And folks, I want to tell you, we got an awful pull from the world, don't we? But God says, look, I'll give you understanding if you ask me. And so the psalmist here says, give me. By the way, God doesn't mind for His child to come and say, give me. You ever have that with your children? Give me, Dad. I need, I need some money, you know, to go wherever I'm going. Give me understanding. If we don't understand something, it's impossible to adhere to that particular principle or that law. And God wants us to understand. Once again, uh, I believe uh, the scripture that I quote so often, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own, what? Understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. The first thing you've got to do in getting understanding, you've got to acknowledge that God knows all, and He sees all, and He can tell you what's needed in your life. And so the psalmist here comes along and says, uh, I need to understand. But wait a minute, look at verse 35. He asked God to do something else. Verse 30, 35 says, Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. Now what does he mean by that? Force me. Okay, go this way. Don't go this way. Go this way, you know. We want to go the wrong ways because that's the pull of our nature. See? But God wants to push you in the right direction. And so the psalmist says, Look, Lord, I already went down that path once. I don't want to go down it again. Hey, listen. All Dad had to do was tell me one time, and that was enough for me. Don't do that. See? It's the same way with God. If God says something... We ought to follow it. And we can say, God, make me. Please don't let me make the wrong decision today. Help me to make the right decision today that I'm about to make. If it's not the right thing, please keep me from it. And so he said, make me to go in the path of thy commandments. For therein do I delight. And by the way, the more you delight in this book the more God's going to delight in your life. Okay? And so, ask God to, number one, teach you. Ask God to give you understanding. Ask God to make you. Uh, you may not want to go God's direction. And, and, and that's natural because of the pull of the flesh. But, ask God to make you to do it. Let's see? And God will do it. But wait a minute. Look down at verse number 36. The psalmist asked him something else. Look at it. Incline mine heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. You and I have a covetous nature. Anybody want to raise their hand with me tonight? We have a covetous nature. Uh, we get something, and Brother Ed, we look around the corner, and we want that, too. 
Uh, have you ever noticed this? You buy your brand new car, what, regardless of what kind it is, and you drive that thing down the street, and before you get it out of the, out of the, the dealer's car, uh, car lot, you see another car go by, and you say, hmm, I like that car. We have a covetous nature. Do you know that's the reason that the Lord gave the 10th commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Be content with that which God gives you. And so the psalmist says here, Look, Lord, uh, incline mine, my heart unto thy testimonies. Now, here's the key. Are you listening? The heart is a decision maker. And the Bible says, Keep thy heart, how? With all diligence. All right? How can we do that if we don't have something that gives testimony of the fact of what is right? This is his testimonies. That, do you, did you ever realize that's why God gave stories in the Bible of different people? Their testimonies of what God did when they did right and when they did wrong, Brother Jeff. God gives the testimonies, the stories in the Bible to show you and I, hey, you make that decision Samson did and went down there in the wrong places, you're going to end up losing your eyes. So you and I need to ask God, incline mine heart unto thy testimonies. But wait a minute. Look there at verse 37. And verse 39, actually verse 37 and 39 are very clo are close together because it talks about turning, turning away. Uh, you and I need to do this. We need to ask God to turn away our life from two particular things. Look at it. Number one, turn away mine eyes from beholding empty things. Empty things. There's a lot of empty things in this world, folks, that we need to ask God to turn our eyes away from. Amen? We don't need them. See? One of the big things is the pleasures of this world or the, the approval of this world. I don't need the, the approval of the world on my life. I need His approval on my life. Amen. See? So we need to ask God to turn our eyes away from that. But now, look at verse 39. That kind of chimes in with verse 37. I turn away my reproach which I fear. Turn away reproach from my life. Don't let me become a reproach to those people that need to be saved. Don't let me be a reproach to my family. Especially my teenagers. My kids who are looking to me to set the example. Folks, I want to tell you something. There's been many a kid that grew up to be just like their parent, and that's good if it's a good thing. But if it's a bad thing, that's a bad end result. Don't be a reproach. Let God turn your life away from being a reproach to be a good example before Him. But wait a minute, very quickly, and I'm going to close. Look at verse 39 and, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 40, 39, 40. The latter part of the verse, he says, For thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. In other words, ask God to establish your life with the Word of God so you and I can live the righteous life that He expects us to and wants us to live. You see, righteousness means always doing that which is right. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you want to do right always? Raise your hand with me. I believe we all do. Why don't we ask God for these things for Christmas? Ask Him, going right down the line there from verse 33 through 40, ask Him for those things for Christmas. That's a great thing. I mean, uh, listen, you might ask God, God, I need a new um, Lincoln Continental. I don't need a Lincoln Continental. Do they still make Lincoln Continentals? I don't know if they do. Don't need a Cadillac. He'd probably end up giving me a Volkswagen. <laughs> or a Hyundai, one or the other, I don't know. 
But here's the point I'm trying to get across to you tonight. Ask God for things that are worthwhile. And the verse I want to close with tonight, and I quoted it earlier, is James 1, 5. If any man lack wisdom, wisdom is spiritual discernment, looking at things from God's perspective. It's looking at things to do right. And if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. So why not asking for something worthwhile rather than something that's going to be temporal? That may lead you away from the Lord? How many times up through the last 45 years have I known families that have asked God for a particular thing and it was to their ruin? For example, and I'm not saying this is wrong, but I've always, uh, I've always, I've always tried to advise my people. For example, if you ask for a new job and a door opens down in, let's say, Atlanta, Georgia, you better make sure you have a good Bible preaching church you go to, you can go to before you go. I've had some families move away to areas where they didn't have a fundamental Bible preaching church. I don't think that's God's will. I really don't. God wants us to remain faithful to Him. And where He leads us, He will always have a place that we can stay near Him. So think about these things that you ought to ask God for this Christmas. Let me ask the question again. Have you ever asked God for something for Christmas? Do it. All right? Let's have prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray you take these things we've studied here in these verses, 33 through 40, that talk about asking you for things. And you said you will not withhold any good thing for, to them that walk up rightly. So help us to walk uprightly. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.